Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very excited for this conversation um, with Dr. Azan Yadin Israel about his book titled Temptation Transformed, the story of how the forbidden fruit became an apple. Um, It's just come out in 2023 from the University of Chicago Press. Um, And this book really does exactly what the title says, which is an absolute compliment in my book, Um, explaining why the forbidden fruit, the source of so many stories, so much art, so many myths, um, became an apple, which I admit I had never really questioned. I was just like, okay, well, that's what it is, right? Uh, Turns out, not even close. There's a whole fascinating story. um, And I think maybe the explanation for the confusion was my favorite part, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, So Azan, first, I'd love to welcome you to the podcast. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Before we get into the many fascinating aspects of the book, uh, we should probably start with some kind of obvious basics. Would you mind introducing yourself a bit and explaining sort of how you came to this particular book? Of course, of course. Um, so I am a uh, professor at, the, at Rutgers University in New Jersey. I'm in two departments. I'm in the Jewish Studies Department, uh, where I teach on uh, ancient rabbinic literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and cognate literature. I'm also in the Classics Department. Uh, there I focus on Greek philosophy, primarily Plato and the pre-Socratic tradition. Um, so... The book is a bit of a departure for me in terms of my training and uh, much of my scholarly writing, but I uh, decided to pursue it because I was unhappy with the Regnan explanation of how the forbidden fruit became an apple, and by chance, I had come across a text that had led me to think that there might be a different explanation. When I completed my um, graduate work, I made a point of continuing to read in uh, Greek and Latin so as not to lose touch with those uh, languages. And when I was doing this early on in my career, this is just a year or two after I got out of grad school, I was reading with a uh, graduate student uh, in the classics department, and um, we were reading a, a passage from Augustine's Confessions, a very famous section where he's discussing the kind of evil that is inherent even in children. And his example was that he and his friends were pelting this helpless sow with coma. And uh, he uh, goes on and discusses this for a while. And I was translating, you know, I hadn't prepared the text. And I, because of French, just translated the uh, pomum, or in plural poma, as apples. And um, Aaron Puchigian, who was the graduate student that I was reading with then and has since become um, a great poet and translator, said to me, ah, no, 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 you know, that's a common mistake. But in Latin, pomum is just a tree fruit. And I was like, ah, yes, I knew that, but kind of the French had intruded. And at the time, I made a note to myself and said, I wonder if that has anything to do with the shift. In other words, if the error that I had made was more typical, and of course, we'll get to that later, but that was the the, the seeds of this project uh, were at that moment. I set that aside. I published on rabbinic sources and um, on Midrash, which is the area I specialize in. But years later, I decided to go back and see if that was a hypothesis that was worth pursuing. And the end result was this book. Wow. Thank you for um, kind of taking us through that process. I think uh, it does a lot to sort of explain uh, the inquisitive nature of the book, I think, uh, the kind of the fact that you're very much asking and answering um, questions. And that kind of leads us to the sort of obvious starting point of why should we start to question that belief that the forbidden fruit is an apple, has always been an apple, and that's just what it is? What are the causes for questioning that? 
Well, the causes are primarily textual. Um, the most obvious place to start is in Genesis chapter 3, where there is no specific fruit designated uh, as the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's simply referred to by the Hebrew word pri, which means fruit, a generic term for fruit, um, which could include an apple, but would need, that would need to be shown. In other words, you would need to present some kind of argument as to why that would be the case and why we would interpret it in that way. And, um, and here we're really entering into the argument of the book, the first chapter of which begins with Genesis 3 and then moves on to um, the, and then moves on to the early interpretation of the forbidden fruit. And what we find is that the early interpreters, rabbinic, um, church fathers, early translators, in other words, the Septuagint in Greek, uh, the Vulgate in Latin, none of them translated as Greek, none of them, uh, sorry, none of them translated as an apple, none of them interpreted as an apple. Um, and that, the backdrop to this is that there is a fairly robust discussion about the identity of the fruit. And there are candidates proposed, um, primarily the fig and the grape, but not the apple. So in a certain sense, I think, you know, as modern readers, our question is exactly the one that you pose. Why would we be skeptical that the forbidden fruit has been an apple? But if we start from the ancient sources, working from Genesis down, then the perplexity is, how in the world did it ever become an apple? I mean, we know that in the end it does, of course. We're at the end of this narrative, and we know that everywhere we turn, the forbidden fruit is an apple, but nothing in the early sources would lead us to the conclusion that that result would, um, in fact, come to be. And this is obviously, um, as you said, from a modern perspective, a very interesting place to sort of begin an inquiry of going, okay, okay, hang on a second. You mean there are no apples? All right. What was there? Um, And we've got this idea you just mentioned of the grape or the fig or maybe both or something like that. So um, if we could go, I guess, through the cases, I I suppose, in turn. First, why was it a grape? And then why could it actually have been a fig? What what were the alternatives to the apple? And why did people think that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, I mean, the grape, there are various reasons given for the grape. Um, There seems to be one dominant theme that links alcohol and sin and you know and obviously the grape kind of is I mean, you can make alcohol from many different things but the grape as the source of wine is the paradigmatic source of alcohol as well uh, and there are some textual not indications about the about the forbidden fruit per se but uh, Aaron and his sons, and therefore the um, Levite priests generally, are forbidden from entering into the tabernacle and later the temple uh, inebriated. So there's some you know, vague sense that the grape and wine are forbidden. Um, and that really is the overarching reason that the grape is associated with the forbidden fruit, that that is identified as the forbidden fruit. Um, the fig comes from a very different set of considerations, and they're primarily textual, because in the uh, chapter that we're talking about, chapter 3 of Genesis, Adam and Eve consume the fruit, immediately realize that they're naked, or in other words, immediately they find that they're ashamed that they're naked, and they cover themselves with the leaves of a fig of a fig tree. Now, those two things, of course, could be read as separate uh, occurrences, but for biblical interpreters, there is at least some kind of scriptural anchor on which to, uh, which, which will hold down the, uh, which will hold down the interpretation that says that if they consumed the fruit and then immediately covered themselves with fig leaves, maybe they were standing next to a fig tree. Ergo, the Mm -hmm. forbidden fruit was a fig. It's not scientifically uh, necessary. It's not an absolute conclusion, but at least least you find the fig mentioned in the biblical text alongside 
the uh, fruit itself, and that that gives you some justification for identifying the forbidden fruit with the fig. And those, in fact, end up being the two dominant traditions, the grape and the fig, although there are others. There are rabbinic traditions that uh, link the forbidden fruit with the citron. Um, there are traditions, textual and also visual, artistic, that represent the forbidden fruit as a pomegranate. Um, some even argue that it is, is wheat, which is an unusual and surprising interpretation. So there's really a very um, broad range of possibilities that are raised over the course of these discussions, you know, the centuries of discussion of the story of the fall of man. And are all of these discussions sort of saying, well, no, it must be the fig. Well, no, I think it's the grape. No, I think it's wheat. Or is there a possibility that it could be multiple things? Or is, have we also received the, have we also essentially made up the idea that it's an apple and that we all agree? Yeah. So that's really one of the most interesting things about this shift towards the apple, which is that up until the apple appears on the scene, all of these other possibilities coexist peacefully. Um, there are, there are um, texts that say, well, this, this authority identifies the forbidden fruit as a fig, and this one with a grape, and this one with a pomegranate. And there's no need to say, and this, and, you know, but this is really the correct one or anything like that. There are uh, cathedrals that have multiple artistic representations of the fall of man, of the transgression. And sometimes the same cathedral will have different fruit. You know, the different representations will have Eve, mm-hmm. handing, Ab- Eve handing Adam a fig, and in another representation, Eve is handing Adam a cluster of grapes. So, um, you know, it, it clearly was not an issue that was disputed in, in, in the sense that you had to ultimately agree on a particular fruit. When the apple appears, it eradicates all the other possibilities, which is a very unusual, historically speaking, uh, dynamic, and one that any explanation of this transformation to the apple tradition needs to account for. Mm. And this is, of course, what you go on to do in the book. So can you maybe first tell us about the common, the existing hypothesis for how the apple becomes the forbidden fruit and why you're not so sure? Absolutely. So the Regnant hypothesis is that the apple emerges as the forbidden fruit because of a Latin play on words. The Latin word for um, an evil thing or bad is uh, malum, and that is also the word for apple. That is also um, the Latin word for apple. There was early on a distinction between the long A and the short A, but that is lost, and uh, the two basically become homonyms. So the hypothesis says something along these lines. Since the forbidden fruit caused mankind's expulsion from paradise, um, the introduction of sin into the world, and so on and so forth, really there was no greater theological malum than that. Therefore, the fruit that is uh, most likely to have caused it was itself the malum apple. So the theological malum sin or evil that befell mankind was caused by the malum apple. That's a very, first of all, it's a very dominant hypothesis. Today, it is cited everywhere. Um, and at this point, it's basically received wisdom. In other words, scholars will just say, you know, as is well known, the Latin similarity of malum and malum really gave rise to this tradition or the identification of the forbidden fruit as, a, as an apple. It's also, at this point, a venerable tradition. I've found it as early as um, in the works of Thomas Brown, who was a polymath who wrote in the uh, mid to late 17th century. 
And he already says in, um, in, the, in his work that discusses kind of common errors, he says um, it is widely understood that the forbidden fruit was an apple because of this Latin play on words. I don't know exactly how far it goes, but it's centuries old. Um, I, however, have never been thrilled with this explanation. Uh, first of all, I think it's, I love it. I think it's wonderful. Anyone who works on biblical interpretation and midrash, you know, this feels like a wonderful midrash, um, like a wonderful commentary. But I have always struggled with the idea that some, you know, Latin scholar sitting in his scriptorium made this play on words and it became so widely embraced that it established the apple uh, in every medium and, ac and, and, and across cultures and eradicated all other possibilities. In other words, that all the traditions of the fig and the grape and the pomegranate and the citron, they all basically were like vanquished by this little play on words. I have to admit it's a very appealing explanation for textual scholars. I mean, who wouldn't want to think that scholars sit in their study and uh, their knowledge of Latin or what have you is ultimately the foundation upon which this central cultural um, symbol rests. But as I said, I, I, I always... I was always a little bit uncertain about that. Um, and in fact, what I started out doing for this, for the project was investigating whether in fact there was substantive textual uh, grounding for this Latin play on words for malum, malum. And briefly stated, there isn't. There just does not seem to be any recognition or almost any recognition among medieval Latin authors that there is this play on words. Um, we have, not only is it absent, which of course, it's very, it's, absence is always a very difficult argument to make, but there are lists uh, as late as someone like Nicholas of Lira, who's writing in the early 14th century and is probably the most prominent Christian Bible scholar of his day, he, contain, he, he includes a list in his commentary on Genesis that says well, there are scholars who mention the fig, who identify the forbidden fruit as a fig. There are scholars who identify it as a grape. And he doesn't even know that the apple is a candidate. He doesn't even mention the apple mm. uh, as a possibility. So here we actually run into a much more fundamental issue. It's not only that these Latin scholars don't know the malum malum play on words, they don't even seem to know that the apple is a candidate for as the forbidden fruit. And that raises a completely different question, which is, if they don't know this, where and when did the apple first appear? So that's a, that which becomes the next challenge. Mm. And a very good challenge, right? Because we start with this book going, hang on a second, what do you mean we're questioning the apple? Um, and then by the time you get to this point in the book, you're like, oh, wow, now I'm really questioning the apple. Hang on a second, where does it come from? Um, and you show that it comes in 12th century France, which is not what I was expecting. So right, right. why there? Why then? Yeah. So. <laughs> First of all, how do we establish this? Because as I said, the Latin sources really don't provide us with any usable information. All we find is absence, absence, absence. The absence of the malum, malum, Latin play on words, and more fundamentally, the absence of any knowledge of the apple itself as the forbidden fruit. So at this point, I shift gears, methodologically speaking. And I figured if the texts don't provide an answer, then I should look at the representation of the forbidden fruit. And the um, third chapter of the book is a survey of the iconography of the forbidden fruit, basically 
of the iconography of kind of these, the fall of man scene, as much as possible trying to identify the nature of the fruit, either because the fruit itself is visible or quite often because the leaves of the tree of knowledge are visible. And when they are represented as fig leaves, those are very, very distinctive leaves, very broad leaves with distinct lobes. So using the iconographic history to trace how the fruit is represented with the aim of discovering where and when it starts to be an apple. And that is the answer to how do we know it appears in 12th century France? That's the first place, that's the first site where artists begin to render the forbidden fruit as an apple. And once they do so, two very interesting things happen. The first is the apple becomes absolutely dominant in French art within a few decades at the exclusion of all the other visual traditions that had preceded it. Prior to the appearance of the apple, artists had represented the forbidden fruit in the way that we had mentioned earlier in terms of the texts, uh, i.e. as a fig, as a grape, as a citron, as a pomegranate, etc. Suddenly, all of those traditions are eradicated, and basically you get a visual monoculture of the apple. The second very interesting thing that happens is that from France, the apple imagery, the apple iconography spreads to Germany, to the Low Countries, and to England. And a similar process occurs, not as quickly, not as dramatically, but in fairly short order, the apple becomes the dominant iconographic representation of the forbidden fruit. It does not spread to Italy, for example. In Italy, the iconography remains loyal to the fig, so that you have forbidden fruit as figs hundreds of years after the apple appears in France, including, for example, into the 16th century, uh, the Sistine Chapel, the fall of man seen in, in the Sistine Chapel is clearly and unequivocally a fig tree, and uh, Adam is reaching for, for a fig. And that's already, you know, in the early um, 16th century. So centuries later, centuries after it appears in France and begins to dominate the French visual landscape, and then the German, British, or sorry, English, the German, English, and uh, Low Countries landscape, it doesn't really make much progress in Italy, which remains loyal to the fig. Okay, that's odd. And the listing of countries certainly suggests some sort of explanation. Um, so why? Why does the apple spread in these places but not others? Why is it so quick? What, what's the mechanism behind this? Yeah, 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 that's right. So that's exactly the question. And what I want to clarify is that at this point, I really don't have an answer at this point in the study. Um, there is no answer, but what we do have is a much clearer historic framing of the question. So we're no longer asking this kind of, I don't know, ethereal question. Why the apple? Why did, why did the apple appear? Um, why was the apple adopted? We have a very clear historic setting. Why did the apple appear in 12th century France? Why did it spread the way it did? And another question is, why did it occur in art, but not in the commentaries? Because if you recall, I mentioned that, for example, Nicholas of Lyra is writing in the early 14th century in Paris, and he does not know the apple tradition, or at least does not mention it in his commentary. And yet, the apple does populate the French art of the time. So that's a third question. So we have why France, why the dissemination that it, uh, that, that, that it experienced, and why this gap between the artistic – 
and the literary sources. So here um, is the solution. And if we want to think of this as a kind of detective novel, this is the moment where you gather everyone into the reading room and say, Here, here's the whodunit. Um, and the answer is, surprisingly, uh, not agricultural. Because sometimes people say, well, you know, maybe there weren't apples in Italy, uh, but there weren't. That's not true. There were apples in Italy. Um, the whole, the agricultural layout doesn't really work with what's happening iconographically. It doesn't map onto it very well. Rather, the answer is linguistic. And um, in order to explain this, I have to give a little bit of background and say that in the Latin sources, uh, one of the challenges of the Malum hypothesis, of the play on words, the Latin play on words hypothesis, is that the Latin sources almost never refer to the forbidden fruit as Malum. If they don't, how could there be a play on words? You know, how would that generate a play on words? That's a challenge to that hypothesis. What they do use, the term they do use predominantly is the Latin word pomum. And pomum, as I mentioned at the outset when I was talking about my mistake in translating, um, in translating Augustine, pomum is a generic term for fruit or tree fruit. Now, in the transition, from Latin to Old French, an interesting thing happens. The Latin word for apple, malum, does not contain any reflexes in Old French. In other words, Old French does not have a word for apple that comes from the Latin word malum, presumably because of the very issue we spoke about earlier, that it comes to mean evil, or they, it comes to be identified with the word evil. They, they're, the two are homonyms. And for kind of superstitious reasons, people don't want to say, please hand me that mal, because that means hand me that evil. Or I love a good mal, I love a good apple, but you're also saying I love evil. You know, things like that. Whatever the reason, historically, Old French does not have the word mal in the sense of apple. It does have mal in the sense of evil, and of course we know that from modern French and also from, um, as a part of speech in English, uh, if you talk about, um, you know, malevolent and things like that, many of those words are Latinate, but they come in through French, maladroit, and the like. So there's no word for apple in Old French, at least none that's based on mal. And probably as a result of that, because of the need to have a specific word that designates the apple, the term that comes from pomum, the French, the old French word pom, begins to narrow its meaning. Like pomum, it had originally meant fruit in a generic sense, but it begins to become more and more specific and designate the apple exclusively. The apple as that fruit that is associated with the word poem. So we have basically a semantic narrowing, what linguists call a semantic narrowing. The word pomum means fruit in Latin. The word poem means fruit in the early strata of Old French. But as time goes by, that meaning narrows and it comes to mean apple. Now, this has a very significant uh, effect in one area. And that area is early translations and retellings of the fall of man narrative in Old French. In other words, the vernacular fall of man narratives in Old French. Why, why is this significant? Because the earliest translators and the earliest poets and storytellers and historians who are writing biblical histories and so forth, overwhelmingly rendered the forbidden fruit as a forbidden poem. As well they should, because for them, the word poem was a generic term meaning fruit. So the earliest 
translation of the book of Genesis into Old French, for example, the Evrat Genesis explicitly states that Eve gave Adam a poem and he ate from it and so forth. However, with the passage of time and as the narrower meaning of poem becomes more dominant, in other words, the meaning of apple, all of those early texts, all of those early vernacular retellings or translations of the fall of man narrative are transformed in the eyes of later readers. Because as soon as poem comes to mean apple in a straightforward, non-interpretive way, it's just the meaning of the word for speakers of Old French, all of those earlier sources, the Bible translations, the Bible retellings, the poems, anything that deals with the forbidden fruit and speaks of it as a poem, all of those are simply and in an unmediated way understood to mean apple. It is understood now that Eve gave Adam an apple and that the fall of man was due to an apple. Now, once this happens, there really isn't any room for multiple candidates. In other words, once you have a biblical translation that says Eve gave Adam a poem, and you understand that in a straightforward way to mean an apple, and once the same poem appears in the retellings and in the poems and in the and in the plays, the Jeu d'Adam is a medieval play that would travel from village to village telling the story of the fall of man, and they use the word poem there. Um, once that's the case, the issue is resolved. The forbidden fruit is a poem, that is to say, it's an apple. So no artist is going to represent the forbidden fruit as a fig. How could you? You know that it's a poem, i.e. apple. No one's going to represent it as a grape. No one's going to represent it as a pomegranate, a citron, and so forth. So the iconographic tradition, driven by this linguistic change, very quickly converges on the apple, and you find the uh, art representing the apple the way we do, i.e. in uh, 12th century France, it becomes the apple and conquers the landscape completely. Mm. But then why England and Germany, but not Spain and Italy? So the reason for that is also linguistic. It is um, because of the influence of French, the word apple in Middle English, its equivalent in Middle English, and the German word, which is the parent of Apfel, both of those words originally were generic terms for fruit. In, even in, in English, apple used to mean fruit more broadly, so that it could refer to an apple, but it could also refer to other fruit. Um, there's a, an interesting reflex of that meaning in modern English, only one that I know of, and that is in the word pineapple, because pineapple was originally the fruit of the pine tree, a pine cone. And when Europeans entered into um, the, the new world, the so-called new world, new for them, uh, world, and discovered this tropical fruit that we today call the pineapple, the triangles on the rind of the pineapple reminded them of the triangles of a pine cone, of a closed pine cone. And they called it the tropical pineapple, the tropical pine cone. Of course, that meaning of apple has disappeared, and we today think of apple only as the specific fruit of the apple tree. But that was the result of the same process, almost undoubtedly under the influence of French. Uh, French was obviously a very dominant language in English, um, you know, since, since the Norman Conquest. And French exerted a tremendous amount of influence on English, both in the incorporation of French words, many of which displaced earlier Germanic, you know, Anglo-Saxon words, but also through what's known as a calc, through uh, a foreign word causing the meaning of a native word to change in and kind of uh, align itself with the foreign word. And that's what happened with apple. 
just as Pom had narrowed from fruit to apple, the word apple narrowed from a word that could be used generically to mean fruit to one that could only mean apple. The same thing happened in German. And that, that can be shown textually. I can, you know, the book lays out how this, you can see that this happens. And the same dynamic occurs because the early vernacular translations of the Bible and the early vernacular uh, retellings of the biblical story of the fall of man predominantly use the word apple. And so, once again, later readers who are approaching these sources after the semantic change are understanding the Bible as stating in no uncertain terms that Eve and Adam uh, sinned with an apple through the consumption of an apple. That's probably happening in conjunction with the influence of French art. French art is also its own influence at this point. So the representation of the apple in French art is also a factor. And the two work in tandem. The iconographic apple tradition from France and the semantics of French bring about this um, kind of like a pincer motion, if you want to think of it in military terms, so that the, the artistic representation and also the textual representation are um, associated with the apple. Well, then why not Italy? Well, simply because this semantic change never occurs in Italy. The Italian word for apple is mela, which is associated or somehow derived from um, the Latin word malum, and it never narrows. It never meant fruit generically. It never had a broader sense, and it never narrows to mean that. It was just the word from the, from the outset. And as a result, the entire dynamic that I'm describing here, the early vernacular translations that use a generic word for fruit, but then that word, the meaning of that word narrows, and so on and so forth, none of that happens in Italy. So Italy continues happy as a clam on its fig-based iconographic path. I mean, they don't have any reason to uh, shift over to the apple. And as a result, you get that kind of incongruity I mentioned, where historically the apple appears in French iconography very early in the 12th century, but into the 16th century, Italy is still representing the forbidden fruit as a fig. Mm. That's a very compelling um, explanation that I do uh, agree and want to point listeners to. There's lots of detail laying out all of these steps and also showcasing a lot of the visual art um, in the book itself, um, which kind of leads now almost to the opposite of my initial question. I first asked, why should we be skeptical um, that it's an apple? And my question now is, why did we believe so long it was an apple? Right, right, exactly. So now, now, now we have the reverse situation. Yes. Um, well, I I would answer that on on two levels. Um, in terms of popular culture, I would say that the most important moment involves the dissemination of imagery through printed material. The invention of the printing press and the early centers of printing all take place in kind of uh, areas loyal to the apple, primarily in Germany, but elsewhere, in, you know, Paris is an important printing center early on. There are many uh, cities, they're mostly in Northern Europe, and they are almost to the one apple territory, so to speak. And in fact, not surprisingly, one of the greatest bestsellers of the early printing age, Luther's translation of the Bible, incorporates images of the Bible in the form of woodcuts into its editions. And when it incorporates an image of the fall of man, we find that Eve is picking an apple. So at that moment, the association of the apple with the forbidden fruit is born on the wings of this new uh, technology across the borders of the apple areas, the apple regions, throughout Europe and beyond Europe. 
And then the apple just becomes self-evident. You see it visually every time you open a Bible that has pictures, illustrations, woodcuts, what have you. There are Adam and Eve and the apple. So in terms of popular culture, wherever these images reach, the apple becomes dominant. It is worth pointing out that it's not universal. In other words, if you look, for example, at Slavic art, I found um, representations. There's a, uh, an altarpiece, for example, in uh, Sophia that dates to the 17th century or uh, that has Adam and Eve with um, a bunch of grapes, with a cluster of grapes. So there are areas where other traditions remain dominant, but everything that we know of in Europe and then later anywhere in um, the European colonies, including the United States and so forth, will be dominated by the apple. A separate question, so that's why like in the broad cultural, that's the broad cultural presentation of the apple. The second question is why have scholars not realize this. In other words, why have scholars maintained the hypothesis of the malum, the Latin play of words, even when it is so poorly attested and so uh, so poorly substantiated? And here there's a very interesting and troubling, as a scholar, you know, uh, dynamic where um, it becomes kind of a closed echo chamber. And everyone assumes it's an apple and then perpetuate the apple in that way. So you find this most clearly in translations where Latin translations that use the word pomum in the context of the forbidden fruit are almost universally translated as apple, even though you just need to open a Latin dictionary and see that pomum can mean many things other than an apple. But once we're familiar with that tradition, it replicates itself in the translation. The same thing is true of um, the imagery or discussions of art history. So the um, chapter that deals with iconography opens uh, with a brief epigraph that says, um, although the account of the fall of man in Genesis 3 does not mention any particular fruit, the fruit has always been regarded as an apple. And that's from the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Art and, Archi and Architecture that came out in 2013. So, I mean, 10 years ago, scholars writing an authoritative um, handbook, a dictionary of Christian Art and Architecture, are making the statement that basically the fruit has artistically always been regarded as an apple, which is just empirically untrue. It's just historically untrue. So it's a very interesting dynamic and one that really needs to be avoided as much as possible in which the assumptions kind of lead us rather than the sources, rather than the material. I think the last issue is that it is a challenge to draw on evidence from such disparate areas. In other words, Anyone who looks at the biblical and early translations will know that wasn't an apple. Anyone who looks at the Latin sources on their own will know that they don't really discuss the apple that much. Anyone who looks at the art historical material will say, ah, the apple appears at a certain place. Anyone who looks at the vernacular might understand something that's going on, but if you don't put them all together, you really can't get the full historical account of what happened. So people working on the biblical sources will just assume, ah, this came about because of the malum malum play on words. You know, people who are working on art will say, ah, it appeared here. I guess that's when the play on words came into effect or things like that. And it's only if you really work in an interdisciplinary way and across each of these historical periods, across the textual and iconographic um, sources that you can, I hope, and at least that's what I've tried to do, that you can offer a robust explanation for the emergence of the apple as the forbidden fruit. Mm.
Well, I think what you've definitely done in the book is uh, present both a mystery and then solve it, which is quite a feat, uh, given that uh, for any listeners intrigued by this, uh, you'll be pleased to know that this book manages to do all of that. And it's not 800 pages long. <laughs> it's actually quite <laughs> readable um, and guided by um, the exact sorts of questions that you've talked us through in this interview. So thank you very much um, for explaining the book to us. Um, but before I let you go, I was wondering if you might have any project that you have your eye on to work on next. You could maybe give us a sneak preview of. Uh, sure, sure. Happily. I um, I have, first of all, an ongoing project, uh, which is a series of um, lexicons that are aimed at allowing English speakers to learn the vocabulary of foreign languages more easily. And basically what these lexicons do is they uh, align a foreign word with an English cognate. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, a foreign word with an English cognate, allowing the um, student or the reader to kind of recognize the connection between the English word that they know and the foreign word that they are learning. So, um, so far I've published um, a volume on German, uh, a volume on Spanish, and I am now finishing the volume on Ancient Greek. So anyone who's interested in those, th those are out there, and now I'm continuing to work on these. So part of my future scholarly plans are to, uh, after I publish the Greek volume, to do the same for uh, French and then Latin, and I think that will be the end of that uh, project. I also have um, two more traditional book projects that I'm working on. One uh, involves the kind of methodological insights of a field of linguistics called contact linguistics. Well, contact linguistics studies how uh, languages behave when they're in close proximity with another language. That is to say, when you have two language communities in close contact. And um, the book that I'm working on is going to try to cull insights from, from contact linguistics to um, develop more robust methodological and conceptual tools for understanding cultural contact more broadly. In other words, contact linguists are working specifically in the contact between languages, and I think this can be fruitfully expanded to other types of linguistic contact. Um, finally, I do have a, a, a book on uh, Plato that I hope to write, but that is still uh, very early on in the project. Um, it has to do with the relationship um, between Plato's metaphysics and uh, language in the later dialogues, but I'm afraid I, I'm not being coy. That's really all I can say at this point, because I myself still need to do all that work. Well, while you are off um, working on those various projects, uh, listeners can read the book we've been discussing, which again is titled Temptation Transformed, the story of how the forbidden fruit became an apple. Azan, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you, Miranda. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.